Thank you, Manju, uh, for uh, letting me to be part of this IC. Uh, so I'll be talking about the eyelid retraction, which is a pretty common condition which we see in our clinics. So if you have to classify the retraction, it can be like based on the etiology, whether it's a neurogenic cause, whether it's a myogenic or a mechanistic cause, or we can divide it into an acquired or a congenital category, whether it's involving the upper eyelid, both eyelids, or just the lower eyelid, uh, and whether it's unilateral or bilateral. So before you go into the management part, it is important to differentiate it from a pseudo retraction. So like, for example, this patient came with the complaint that his left eye looks a little more prominent. What he actually had is a ptosis in the right upper other eye. If you see the MRD in the other eye, it seems to be pretty low. And there is a compensatory uh, overaction of the levator of the other eye, which causes this appearance of a retracted glow. So this needs to be ruled out, and this needs to be pointed out to the patient. And many a times, the review of the old photographs actually tends to convince the patient, look, this is the, the eye which is like what the patient feels sometimes is kind of is having the problem, is actually not the problematic eye, it's the other eye. So uh, going on to the myogenic causes, thyroid we know is the most common cause of upper eyelid retraction. It can be unilateral, it can be bilateral, it can present in various stages, but most of the time what we see are the retraction comes in the burnt out stage of the disease when the acute inflammation has gone, when the active stage of the disease is already over. Now this lady has this uh, asymmetrical bilateral kind of retraction more in the right eye, much more, but if we see the left eye that also has a little lateral flare. Characteristically in thyroid, the lateral part of the eyelid seems to be much more retracted than the medial part. Uh, probably something to do with the, the lateral part of the levator, which is much more stronger. And this, uh, since the cause remains an increased innervation because of the circulating catecholamines, probably the levator tends to get kind of a little more um, retracted on the lateral side. Also, uh, in the chronic stage, what we see are the inflammation and the scarring, which uh, follows the active phase of the disease. So important here is before you jumping on to manage this patient is to control the thyroid dysfunction. Now if you see this lady, she has this upper eyelid retraction. She seems to have a little bit of congestion, used to get this on and off uh, mild activity sort of picture, some redness congestion, which used to go off just with topical lubricants and steroids. Her thyroid was still uncontrolled. Now once we control the thyroid status, this was what the picture was. It actually sometimes tend to kind of improve the retraction if you control the thyroid status. So doing a surgery at this stage will not be an appropriate idea. Let the thyroid come under control and then whatever residual retraction is there, we can always take care of it at a later sitting by surgical or non-surgical means. For a temporary correction of the retraction, Botox injection to the levator muscle is a good idea. If the patient does not want surgery or if suppose the thyroid is not under control, you cannot take up the patient for surgery straight away. We can inject a little bit of Botox into the levator muscle via a transcutaneous or a transconjunctival route. I prefer a transconjunctival route because the chances of getting a ptosis is little less by this route. And the dose can be about 2.5 to 5 unit and you usually tend to uh, inject it just at the upper border of the tarsus uh, at the lateral and the medial side and uh, can avoid the central part so that you don't get an unexpected overcorrection. So it gives a decent amount of correction, like this gentleman had an active disease, we can see a little bit of congestion and chemosis here, but he had to attend a marriage. So he wanted to you know, do some correction for this kind of retraction so that you know, the pictures doesn't look that uh, obvious. So we gave a little bit of injection to the levator and it was, it was not fully corrected, but yeah, uh, decent enough to kind of make the pictures a little more probably uh, better. This kind of conditions, we don't have any other option but to go ahead with a tarsorophy. It's not, tarsorophy is usually not done for cosmetic purpose in thyroid eye disease, but essentially for functional reasons like severe coronal exposure, severe disease ca causing exposure, keratopathy and all. So, and it can be temporary or permanent depending on what is the status of the cornea and depending on what is the indication you are doing it for. But the definitive surgery for recession, um, uh, for retraction usually remains in uh, levator resection. Uh, a recession procedure, which is uh, done via a transconjunctival or a transcutaneous route. So this is a small clip about the levator recession procedure, which has been done uh, by the transconjunctival route. So what you do, you incise the conjunctiva at the upper border of the tarsus after everting the eyelid, separate the conjunctiva from the underlying mullus and the levator muscle, levator aponeurosis, and undermine the conjunctiva a little bit so that all these adhesions are kind of free. Otherwise, whatever recession of the levator you do, that is not going to go back and give you the desired amount of correction. So once that is done, you identify the levator aponeurosis, levator mullus complex, incise that all throughout, specifically on the lateral part to take care of the lateral flare, which is 
quite prominent in the thyroid patients and again undermine it on the anterior surface of the levator. Again, make it free. Basically, the aponeurosis become free anteriorly and posteriorly so that it can now easily recess. How much amount to, uh, amount to kind of undermine and recess? It's, uh, I prefer to go by the intraoperative correction. You do the surgery under minimal amount of anesthesia so that the patient just have uh, analgesia but no akinesia so that you can assess the correction with the contralateral eyelid on table. So leave it just corrected or maybe slightly overcorrected on table. And usually, uh, as a rule, we tend to see that the eyelid tends to move up a little bit in the post-operative period. So if your first post-op day, the patient seems to be fully corrected, then probably it's not a you know, very nice scenario. You should not be very happy. But a little bit of overcorrection on first post-op day is what you desire, one or two millimeter overcorrection. Then over the period of next one or two weeks, you expect it to come to the position where you want it to be. So this is the uh, pre and the post-operative uh, picture of one of the patients who undergone this procedure. Coming to the mechanistic causes, uh, trauma and post-surgery remains the most common ones. These kind of pictures are pretty common. I'm sure all of us must have seen this. A badly repaired eyelid laceration, uh, uh, which the primary sitting would have been the best scenario to handle the, you know, to avoid this kind of picture. But uh, uh, doing a, like if, if it's a localized sort of retraction, very kind of, you know, localized to one particular part of the eyelid, you can just manage it with just doing a pentagon excision, depending on the laxity of the eyelid. If not, a diffuse sort of retraction obviously needs a skin graft, which Vikas has already shown the photographs. I'm not going to the details of it. And uh, like this gentleman was managed with a pentagon excision with a little bit of 5-FU injection to take care of the residual scar, whereas this lady had to undergo a skin graft because the scarring was more diffuse here, not a localized one. Uh, in the uh, mild cases, international 5-FU is a good option where you want to avoid the surgery or maybe as a pre-operative or a post-operative adjunct measure. Uh, and it usually is effective in the initial stages of the scarring, where the scar is still red. It's not a white scar, it's not a mature scar. So you can inject it into the scar, and you can give multiple sittings, which can be spaced over a couple of weeks. And um, it, it basically loosens up the scar and can correct a mild amount of retraction, like what happened in this patient. Uh, one more thing we have to be careful is to find out what exactly is causing the retraction. Sometimes in thyroid, it's not the eyelid only which is at fault. It's the glow, the prominence of the glow, which actually tends to push the eyelid upwards or downwards. So if you don't take care of it, or if you don't identify that cause and do an eyelid surgery be before taking care of the prominence of the glow, then you will not get a desirable result. Like in this lady, because of the prominence of the glow, the eyelid, since the glow prominence usually happens in the slightly lateral direction, you tend to see the lateral flare much more common. So the lateral part, the highest point of the eyelid actually shifts a little bit more laterally. Now, just by doing a decompression, you are actually bringing the highest point of the eyelid more towards the center, back again. These are the pre-decompression and, and the post-decompression photographs where you see that the prominent part of the eyelid is actually shifted lateral, more medially once the eye globe goes back. So e this patient doesn't even need any surgery for the eyelid retraction. So this is important to identify it. Post-surgery, again, quite common. Post-osis surgery, aponeurotics repair. The results are quite unpredictable. They most quite commonly land up with overcorrection and retraction, and all you have to do is to kind of adjust it once again. Post entropy and tussle fracture, the upper lid procedure that we do very frequently. If you do not recess the levator, the upper fragment of the tussles, what you recess uh, while doing the uh, kind of tussle fracture procedure, if that is not recessed nicely, postoperatively, you might land up with an eyelid retraction because you are essentially shortening the posterior lamina of the eyelid. So it's important to recess that to avoid that post-op retraction, which can be very severe at time causing exposure keratopathy. So this patient, you have to lengthen the lamina once again by putting a spacer in the eyelid. So this was one of those patients who had undergone a cutler beard procedure, and we all know after cutler beard, if you don't give anything, any support for the posterior lamina, patients can land up with an entropion along with a retraction of the eyelid. So this lady also undergoing to, had to had to be, you know, a cartilage graft has to be done to support the posterior lamina and to lengthen the eyelid to take care of that upper eyelid retraction because her cornea was getting bad. Another patient where, again, this was a post-traumatic, post-chemical injury, in fact, patient where the tarsus has uh, undergone necrosis in the acute phase of the injury and he landed up with this entropion and a shortening of the upper eyelid, essentially a shortening of both the, uh, both the uh, posterior and the anterior lamina, more of the posterior lamina. So even after an evisceration procedure, doing a mucous membrane graft, he still had this retraction of the upper eyelid for which a prosthesis fitting was not possible. So we again lengthen the upper eyelid by using a cartilage graft for the posterior lamina. 
So low allele detraction, there can be various causes again, and how you manage it, it depends on the etiology. If there is horizontal laxity, you do allele shortening. If there is no laxity, essentially it's you recess the retractors or you put a spacer. So these are the photographs which I've taken from Dr. Vikas. Uh, these are the pre and the post-operative photograph for one of the patient who is undergoing a recession of the low allele detractors. And if for patients where the low allele detraction is associated with a prominent globe, it's a good idea to lengthen the eyelid by, by using a spacer rather than only doing a recession of the low allele detractors. If suppose there is an associated hollowing of the low allele also along with the retraction, then you can give some volume by using a dermis fat graft, just not just the dermis, but some fat also. Uh, this study was published from LBPI. This is one of the reports from the LBPI, in fact, where a temporary correction can be obtained by injecting fillers into the lower eyelid retractors, uh, lower eyelid, to kind of stand the eyelid little up and take care of the retraction. Neurogenic, again, various causes, aberrant third nerve regeneration, myasthenia, facial palsy remains the most common cause, which Vikas is going to talk probably, and we had it in the first lecture also, so I'm not going to the detail. So to conclude, uh, eyelid retraction actually causes a lot of functional and cosmetic implication and we need to assess the patients properly and uh, um, formulate an appropriate treatment guideline to give the satisfactory outcome. Thank you.